Welcome to the New Grad Success Summit. I'm so excited. In this session, we are going to be diving deep into documentation secrets and helping to ensure that you are a documentation pro. I'm here with Dr. Aaron Hackett. He is a physical therapist, but also a utilization or clinical reviewer. He's going to tell you what the heck that means and why that's really helpful in teaching you how to document like a pro. Thanks for being here, Aaron. Yeah, thank you, Emma. It's my pleasure. Well, do you want to go into uh, quickly what a utilization or a clinical reviewer is? Absolutely. So I'll try and be as quick as I can because I know that there's lots of information out there. I know that I've already met with you once about what this is, so they could certainly get access to that through you, I assume. Um, but uh, my, my job title is a clinical reviewer. So what I do is I'm reviewing clinical notes that come to me when providers like you um, – are requesting additional care or sometimes even uh, initial care for your patients. Generally, this is for uh, or through a, a um, health plan of some kind. Uh, I don't do it for uh, direct Medicare. We do do some uh, for Medicare, uh, like Advantage plans, and as well as some Medicaid plans. Um, and that's just a part of what is considered utilization management. So I, I work for a utilization management company. And then my title is a, is a, a clinical reviewer for that. Um, but yeah, my primary job is looking at, um, looking at notes and the information that is sent and then using uh, guidelines that we have established, some of which are established by the health plan, some are established by Medicare. It all depends. There's a lot of different ones. And then um, seeing if that information would be sufficient to show that a patient should continue to be seen by, by you, the providers. Awesome. So you're basically looking at notes a lot of the day and helping to say, this is a good note, this is not, and this is approved or not approved, right? Right. To a certain, yeah, to a certain extent, that kind of boils it down. Gotcha. Gotcha. So if y'all get denials, blame Aaron. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, Aaron has made an awesome PDF to help us sort of visualize documentation best practices. So let me quickly share my screen here. And we will go into documentation best practices. So Aaron, in general, what should new grads do to help make sure that they are basically having the best notes possible? So yeah, uh, you know, some of the information that I have planned to go through uh, today uh, is certainly going to be in, in the handout that's, the, well, the PDF, whatever it is you're showing, whatever <laughs> format. Um, <laughs> But I, I want to highlight some certain things that may not necessarily be there. So hopefully you're all taking notes, uh, you have good memories, whatever. Um, but to start off with documentation best practices in general, these are some general ideas that if you can follow these, this is going to take care of some of the major issues that I see. Um, and one of the first things that you really need to know and start to understand, and if you don't understand these concepts, Certainly reach, you know, reach out to me, reach out to Emma, reach out to someone that can help you. But um, the first one is you need to understand what the definition of skilled care is. A lot of times we hear the term skilled care and we immediately think that means a skilled nursing facility or some kind of a rehab facility. And that's just a part of it. Any care that a licensed rehab provider is giving is supposed to be skilled care whether it's in outpatient, inpatient, skilled nursing, um, whether it's occupational therapy, physical therapy, even uh, speech to a certain extent, um, that's all considered skilled care. And so by that I mean it's care that is so complex in nature that um, a lay person, the patient or their caregiver, cannot do that on their own, even with sufficient training. Um, there's a lot that goes into that and you know that's a topic that we could do we could do an entire you know webinar just on what skilled care means and how to really determine that but um, in general that's kind of what you want to be understanding in the care that you're going to give and then you need to be able to document that level of skill um, one other key concept that you need to understand also is reasonable and necessary your care has to be reasonable and has to be medically necessary um, so that means that that care needs to be appropriate and it also needs to be supported by research and not just research, but it's going to be kind of 
on a level playing field with what the majority of your peers are doing for that similar type of care. So if, if there's research and then your peers are saying that uh, skilled care for a certain diagnosis is, you know, maybe just over a couple months and it's only a few visits, but you're trying to do it for, you know, three times a week for 12 weeks, that's outside of what's um, reasonable and necessary. Um, so hopefully you can kind of get those uh, concepts because they're going to, it's gonna, that's going to all come into play with the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, some other best practices is you always, um, you always need to document in reference to function or a level of disability. Um, and I'm going to give you some other kind of examples or topics that, that talk about that, but re remember that best practice. Um, start using clinical practice guidelines in what you are doing. Hopefully in school you are all introduced to uh, clinical practice guidelines or CPGs. Um, a great reference is uh, JOSPT or the sports orthopedic and sports section of the APTA. There's also, um, there's other organizations both within the United States and internationally that create uh, peer reviewed CPGs but you need to become familiar with those because that's what's going to establish that baseline of what's considered what your peers kind of do for care. Um, those give recommendations based on research and the strength of the research on care for certain, um, certain diagnoses or body parts. Um, let's see. Another great thing that you should get into the habit of doing, and it's, um, this one's a little bit tedious, probably a little bit boring. You may want to shoot me after you do it, but this is very helpful. Um, you need to look up a few of the health plans that you are a provider for. Th these, this should be accessible on their website somehow. The tedious part is going to be finding it. But all of those health plans should also have some kind of a clinical guideline that they also utilize when they do um, some kind of, or to determine what's considered medically necessary. That's the information that they would be using when they uh, underwrite the policies that people are buying for their actual health plan. Um, and it's information like that, that myself or other people that do reviews utilize to determine if care is considered medically necessary under a specific health plan. Um, let's see, use, um, be sure to use standardized outcomes and measures. So if your patient has some kind of a, let's say they have a fall risk, you better use a standardized measure to say that they have that fall risk. Just saying they have it's not good enough. Uh, and that's the same if it's a shoulder problem or a neck problem. Um, you need those measures in there. Um, make sure that you actually update the goals in the documentation on a regular basis. That doesn't mean every single clinical note, but make sure that those goals over time are progressed and that your documentation shows that. And then the, one of my last best practice, well, I've got two more of the best practices and then we, you know, we can move on to other stuff. I've got all night people. We're going to be here all <laughs> night. Um, Try not to use the copy function when you're doing your uh, electronic health record, um, especially for the important stuff that we're going to talk about today. Um, every once in a while, it's okay. And it's certainly understandable. I know you need to get through your documentation quickly. Um, but what I see time and time again is that people copy over like, um, you know, they'll have functional scores from the eval that are still listed as the only score in the documentation and the patient has been being seen for like two months. Well, how do we know if they're progressing? We don't. So that's a very, you know, that's, that's poor documentation. And then my last one, this is a little bit more of a pet peeve, but it, show, it shows no function at all, is you need to avoid giving an anatomy lesson in your documentation. Um, we all wanna sound like we're doctors. We all wanna sound like we're really smart. But um, subjectives and objectives and assessments that just go into kinematics and, you know, arthrokinematics and they talk about um, 
ring dysfunctions and, and, you know, pelvic obliquities and all these things that none of that talks about function. We all know that there are people out there that have um, pelvic issues, um, imbalances that they can function at 100% and they're totally fine. Why they don't have pain, we don't know. But if you can't go the next step to translate that into some kind of a functional problem or a disability, then you're going to miss the boat on showing that there's some kind of a, a there's a problem that requires your skilled care. So those are some initial best practices. Any questions so far? <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. Wow. Where were you when I was in PT school? No, this probably is probably still in PT school. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great. That was extremely helpful. And that's really important to know that, you know, it's not about the anatomy, that it's more about what is limiting them from actually getting back to their daily life, from getting back to being you know, integrated in society. So that, no, those were great, great lessons. Now, are there any specific tips to prevent audits? Because I know when we get into the real world, you know, life is so busy, clinical work is so busy, we're seeing tons and tons of patients. So I know you went through best practices, but are there any more specific tips to prevent audits? Right. That's a really good question. Um, and there certainly are ways that you can prevent audits. Um, there's all kinds of different, you know, there's a lot of different types of audits. Usually the most scary ones to think about right now or that are on everybody's minds are Medicare audits. Um, but certainly health plans, they have the option to come in and um, audit you as well. Um, really the biggest thing that you want to watch for, uh, and, and I myself, I don't, I don't do audits. Um, so this is based just kind of on, on patterns that I see on, on providers that I, if I were doing audits, I would certainly flag them. Um, but one of the first things is just, if you are an outlier, um, that's gonna, you know, if you do something to set yourself apart from what your peers are doing, that's, you know, that's already gonna set you up for some kind of a flag. Um, and so, some thoughts that I had on this, one is really, really try not to use blanket um, frequency and durations. And unfortunately I see this a fair amount and I've even heard of providers that they're the clinics that they work for kind of have a required plan of care that every patient gets a certain, they, they all have the same frequency and duration. And that's sad. Um, but what happens is it starts to show that for no matter the, the, the diagnosis, everybody gets the same plan of care. And that shouldn't make sense. That would be like saying everybody that goes to the, their primary care physician, they should all get antibiotics. Um, well, they're probably not all sick. Sometimes they go for a heart condition. Sometimes they go because they sprain their ankle. Sometimes they go because they're a hypochondriac. So it doesn't all mean that they all need the same care. Well, if all of your patients are have a plan of care of three times a week for eight weeks. That's, that's, I know specifically that's one thing that Medicare will actually look for. I have heard that and seen that um, as, as one of the ways that they flag. Um, similarly to that, don't use modalities or, you know, modality codes, um, e-stem, ultrasound, iontophoresis, don't use those on every patient, every treatment. Because uh, again, it looks like everybody's getting the same care. Um, most payers, they now know that there's very little research to support using those. So if you're continually using those on everybody, um, it shows that you're not treating in regards to what our research shows you should be treating. And so it would make it look like you're doing this just to, you know, for the benefit of the clinic. Um, and then same idea, um, care that is repetitive. So uh, whether you use a exercise table or you just write it each time or you do something, and again, this is where that copying and pasting comes in. If every treatment looks the same, or if we were to look at your exercise table and all of those exercise categories are the same, maybe a few have been added, but you're still continuing the same things, um, it's going to look like that you're not really progressing anything. Um, 
And so uh, along with all of those, if that documentation doesn't show any progress, then um, if an audit were to happen, um, that's something that they could come back to you and say, well, this patient wasn't progressing, so we're not gonna pay for that. Um, and one other tip that I have, and this is more of a proactive thing, is if your clinic is not already doing some kind of an internal audit, um, audit program or system, maybe that's something you could volunteer to do. Uh, and it could be as simple as just looking if providers are giving functional measures and progressing goals. It could be as simple as that. Or you could find the actual criteria that Medicare uses or things like that, and you could get you know down to the nitty gritty. But um, at least in my opinion, those are things that I think need to be done uh, to, to avoid being audited. That's great. No, this is this is perfect. And for those of you listening, this may seem dry, but as, as a seasoned clinician, this is so valuable because especially as a new graduate, if you can go into a clinic and be like, hey, I know how to document so we won't be getting audits. I know how to do this correctly. You are going to see supervisors eyes light up and say you are the chosen one because it really <laughs> it really is so valuable especially in private orthopedic practices because this is their livelihood you know if you are looking to get it hired at a small private clinic and and that every single patient is extremely valuable and they need to make sure that their treatments are getting approved so that they're getting reimbursed. So if you're working for them and then they're coming back and your patients months later are getting audited and, and those, those notes are getting denied, that means that your supervisor will not have cash to pay you. You know, they will not have cash to stay in business. So it's extremely valuable to know documentation and know how to have defensive documentation to prevent audits. It will help the clinic, but it will also help your patients because say your patient needs more visits. If you are appropriately, right, Erin? If you're appropriately describing why they need more visits and like all the things you've done and that you may get those approval. But if you're just right. copying and pasting and just doing the same thing, then unfortunately your patient may get the short end of the stick and will not get approved for those extra visits that could really help them with their pain or their functional mobility. So um, Aaron's on fire. Good. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, let's go into um, taking a look at some of these document snippets and going into common mistakes and how we can make sure that we are fixing those mistakes and preventing those mistakes. So walk me through the PDF that you've made here. Okay. And I assume that uh, they'll have access to this. Yes, for everyone listening uh, down below, I'll have this PDF um, so you can get access to this as well because I know this may be um, small on the screen. You can also go to the bottom corner and hit the little rectangle and that should open this up to widescreen as well. Yeah, so um, I had a hard time kind of deciding how to do this. I know that everybody would love to see you know, snippets of of what I actually see on a, on a regular basis and, and you know, real examples of, of notes. Um, I thought it would be better to share um, small examples of different concepts and then what you guys can do is you can go and um, hopefully apply these as we talk about them and um, you know, kind of integrate them into your specific area. Because you know, depending on how many people are watching this in all of your different areas, uh, it's hard for me to try and just, you know, if I were to use three or four actual examples, I don't know that it would cover everything. So let's, the, the, the intro paragraph is not that important. It's just kind of me blabbing on. Um, but if we get down to those bold areas, this is what, this is what needs to be kind of in, so if you think about an entire episode of care, so a patient from eval to discharge, you need to make sure that the information that is listed here in bold, that's information that you want there on um, you know, a, a regular basis. It doesn't have to be every single treatment, but it needs to be enough that it's showing progress. Um, so obviously specific subjective information about how the patient is progressing, and by specific, I mean specific to their functions, 
So you need to interview that, you know, when that patient comes in, you need to be asking them, you know, how are you doing now with, with getting out in the yard? How are you with your, with getting your house clean? How are you at work? As opposed to just saying, Hey, how you doing? Get on a hot pack. You're not going to have any functional information. Okay. Whether it's you that's asking these questions, you know, the, the, the PT or it's your PTA or OT, OTA, whoever, um, you need to get that specific information. Um, objective outcomes. Um, you want to try and use standardized measures as much as possible, as, uh, as much as possible, whether they are, um, an outcome tool or uh, a functional assessment tool, you know, whether it's like a dash or an ODI or, um, you know, a PDMS for, for, for our peds friends, uh, those they've been researched and they're kind of considered the gold standard. And those are what are still recommended in the peer reviewed CPGs. And so that's why I also recommend using those. Um, same thing with functional measures. Uh, things like timed up and go, two minute walk. Um, for those that are doing ACL rehab, things like your hop test and your Y excursion. Um, again, you don't have to have those every single treatment, but those are the things that we're going to be looking for because they are considered more of a gold standard. Um, the treatment, I mean, we all heard this in school. There needs to be enough information that the treatment can be replicated. And as we get down, you'll see a few examples. So um, simple assessment. So remember when I talked about don't give an anatomy lesson, this is where I'm talking about it. I've got a, an example down below. Um, so make it simple. Obviously you want to make it so that it shows progress, but in your assessment is where you should be assessing if there was progress or not. Most assessments I see is all it is, is an assessment of how the patient tolerated the treatment. And that's not what the purpose of the assessment is. It's good to have that and legal, you know, for legality reasons, obviously, you know, you want to make sure that the, their, the treatments are going well when you see them, they're not, you know, you're not killing them or something when they're there, but you're assessing if the overall treatment is being successful and that's over time. Um, so let's see clear, you know, plan of care that is regularly updated. We kind of already mentioned that don't just copy and paste it over. Um, so I'd say let's kind of scroll down okay, and we'll, perfect. um, and then I have one quick question to go yeah. back to, you know, avoiding the jargon, you know, as a physical therapist and probably, you know, as a speech therapist or OT as well, you know, there are a lot of acronyms. What is your thought as a, as a reviewer for acronyms? Um, there, there are lists available of what are, um, considered common medical acronyms. Um, I would say if it's an acronym that you have seen in published literature, so again, this is where I go back to the CPGs or it's one that you're familiar with from school, it's probably okay to use. Um, if it's an acronym that you saw at a course that is a, um, I hate to use the term guru, but if it's kind of a course where um, it's their own way of doing things, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, like Maitland or um, uh, what are some other ones, Emma? Um, you know, like Maitland courses, ASTEM courses, um, or some of the taping courses like Rock Tape, oh, okay. um, KT Tape, um, Diane Lee courses. Um, or if it's like a, a specific manual course that was maybe international, I would avoid using their specific jargon or their specific acronyms because they're not, um, they're not used across the board and they're not recognized. Yeah. Got it. That's, that's good, good to know. Yeah. It's a good question. Good. Good. Okay. So we've got some amazing subjective examples. Yep. Here. So how, how I broke this out is, so I gave some snippet examples for all of the different things that we just talked about in bold and it, uh, they're broken out into both a poor example and a better example. I'm not going to say a perfect example. Um, cause you don't necessarily need perfection. We just want it to be better for both outpatient and then kind of skilled and home health. Um, I apologize for any of this, any speech friends out there. Um, I don't review speech and I've never done speech treatment. 
So for me to come up with snippets, I think it would just, <laughs> it would probably just be really bad. So um, hopefully you can apply these. If you have further questions, you know, if I can't help you, I, I do have friends that review speech that I could, you know, point you to in the future. But Excellent. So, I, think, I think we can sort of take the general, you know, yeah. the general idea, like Aaron's going over like specific examples right now, but I think, you know, through these use cases, you all are going to understand how, how you can use it for each of your profession. Yeah. Right. So real quick, I, and it's not my plan, just, you know, you guys are smart, you can read this and you can think about it, but just to point out a few things. So for subjectives, we'll just go to the outpatient one. Uh, obviously the poor one has limited information just as the patient returns to PT stating they're improving slowly, but surely, um, they had a good weekend therapy is helpful. Now, if you think about it, this is a subjective. I see the subjective similar to this every day, almost all day long. So now if we go to the better one, we just, we get more information. Patient returns to PT stating they have done their home exercise program four to five times a day. They state they had a good weekend as they were able to mow the lawn, go to Home Depot and tolerate an hour drive. So see, those are all functional things, but it's just, it's in the words of the patient, but still it's helpful because we know now that the patient can do those things. Um, this has been the first for all of those since starting care. So the provider now quantified when those things, you know, if they had been able to be done before or not. Uh, they say therapy has been helpful, blah, blah, blah. So now skilled nursing um, or home health. Upon entering the patient's home area, you know, wherever it is, they're in bed and says, okay, to start therapy. And there's a caregiver. I see one sentence, um, again, even in skilled nursing and home health, I see a quick little one sentence for subjective all the time. But better, more information, upon entering the patient's uh, area in bed with care... <laughs> I didn't realize the <laughs> caregiver was in bed with the patient. There should be a comma there. Sorry, people. Uh, it's PDF, so it's permanent. You can laugh at me every time you read it. Um, maybe that's happened to one of you in home health for, yeah, I don't know. Think kinky things can happen. Um, when asked the patient, they state that the caregiver has practiced the walking with the walker. They were afraid to go outside. They want to work on going outside. They had trouble getting to MD appointments. So those kinds of things are very helpful. Um, so now if we move on to the objective, we just see a little bit of the more. A lot of times in outpatient, objective is just, it, for whatever reason, there's like some rule that objective just means range of motion and strength, which is not good. Um, this is where you list your outcome scores. So things like a DASH or a PSFS, um, Berg, Tenetti, whatever it may be. Um, and then you can also give um, your range of motion and your strength because those certainly those can still be helpful and those can be tracked. Um, skilled nursing facility, home health, same idea. Um, what I see a lot of is scores that are missing. Um, and I don't quite understand why. I think sometimes it may be that the patient has maybe, maybe they're having a bad day um, or there's some reason why. So, like if you see in the example, the current, the Berg score was not taken, but the eval one was. The tug score was not taken, but the eval one was. Um, in the better one, of course, it's better to give those scores because it shows progress. Now let's say that that patient was not doing well enough to do those scores. If you wanna have real defensible documentation, you would give a quick little sentence as to why you don't have a current score, either um, you know, if this is your, so I know with skilled nursing, with home health, you kind of have specific times that you do your, your progress notes, um, according to Medicare, especially just do a quick line that says something like, you know, patient regressed. We did not do, you know, did not do Berg score because of, I don't know, they broke their hip or, you know, whatever they, whatever, whatever it was, they were just don't use their in bed with the caregiver. <laughs> um, so does, do those make sense so far, Emma? Yeah, definitely. So I have two questions. And for those of you, if you have more questions, you can you know, comment below. And then um, we will be trying to do a live panel on August 17th. And so we'll try to convince uh, Aaron here and see if that fits in his schedule. Um, so you can also ask questions then as well. So I have two questions. Um, so 
I never knew that subjective was as important. Is like, is it an automatic audit if I only have one simple sentence? Like how big of a role does subjective really play in the whole documentation part? Um, I don't think that if you have a, if you have a minimal subjective, I don't know that it's going to necessarily flag you for an audit. Um, however, it's just another tool that you can use to establish um, what that patient's functional ability is. Uh, and it shows that you are using more skill in, in how you're treating that patient. Um, so, you know, as far as concentration on, on where to, you know, where to concentrate your time and documentation, I would say the subjective is probably, um, you know, it's not where you're going to spend most of your time, but it's certainly an area that could improve if you are just doing a simple statement. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's very fair. And that's important to know because I really never knew that subjective was so important, but I see a different, a definite difference between a poor subjective and then a better one. And it, and it makes the note stand out as more impactful. So that makes sense to me now looking at that. Um, and then for the objective. So I guess, you know, in ortho, I always remember just doing range of motion and MMTs and sorry, OTs and speech therapists, we're not neglecting you. Um, you can replace those with any of the statistics that you want to use, any of the values you want to use. But, um, you know, if we just have range of motion MMT, how, 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 once again, how bad is that compared to having it plus having a dash or something mm -hmm. else? Well, unfortunately, a lot of those, what we would consider objective information, obviously the, there are norms, like there's kind of a normal range of range of motion and strength. Um, or if we're, if we're talking about like occupational therapy, there, there's norms for, um, you know, ability to get dressed and care for yourself and those kinds of things. Uh, and those in, in themselves are a little bit more functional. And to be honest, I'm going to just a little secret tidbit here in general occupational therapist documentation is better than physical therapists so um that's one way to make friends with them right <laughs> um people can people can well there's not a lot of research to show that range of motion correlates with function or even strength to a certain extent we know that if strength improves, that can improve function, but we don't know to what extent. Same thing with range of motion. Um, so take, for example, there's a lot of people out there. We've all seen them at the you know, grocery store, wherever it may be. Um, they go to reach for that top shelf to get their, I don't know, what's on the top shelf at the grocery store, the potato chips. <laughs> um, and if you really look at their shoulder motion, it's like what, 140 degrees maybe. Um, but they're out there living their normal life. Um, it could be the same for bending over to pick up, pick up something or, you know, turning your head to look at a, a blind spot. Range of motion doesn't tell the whole story. And so that's where getting a functional score that has been, um, been standardized to show functional progress, that's where it comes into play. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then one more question about these uh, functional tests, like the Berg, you know, the tug, you know, it's, it's so busy, you know, the clinic is so busy. So is it okay if we're doing those, you know, once a week or, you know, once every, you know, five treatment sessions versus every single time. I know you suggested that every time is best, but how much does that impact documentation? Yeah. So, um, if I suggested that you do them every time, I probably misspoke. So hopefully I didn't say that, but you can go back and edit it out. Right. <laughs> and I, I could have just misinterpreted um, too. So no problem. You, you're doing wonderful. <laughs> you want to make sure that you do it enough to show progress. Okay. But most of those, and again, this is where it comes down to knowing the tests that you use or the scores that you use. Most of them have um, a time period in which they were researched to show progression. So uh, an example I, I use a lot of the time is uh, the lower extremity function scale. Uh, this is, sorry, OTs. Some of you might be familiar with it. Uh, or we could even do uh, 
this disability of arm, shoulder, and hand, the DASH score. Most of those are studied within about a four to six week time period. Um, so that's kind of the same time period that someone like me is going to be looking for progress. So as long as there is a score, you know, maybe there's an eval score. And then within about the next four to six weeks, if you're showing significant progress within that time period, I'm not going to be looking for scores for all of the other visits. Does that make sense? Yes. A hundred percent. Thank you. That would be the same for Berg or a Tinetti or, but you kind of have to know the time periods with which those are studied. And that just goes in, you just got to get in there and you got to read the articles on them on, on, you know, how they were, um, how they were like developed and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, that, that makes complete sense. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. We'll go to functional measures here. Yeah. So functional measures really quick. This is kind of the same. It's going to be the same concept. It's just that functional measures are a little bit different than an outcome score. Um, so the top one, 50% participation in 50% participation in sports or recreation. Still working, tolerates some sitting. I see percentages all the time. Percentages um, are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> because I know I used to use them. Generally, what this means is that you're either asking the patient what they think they are doing. So there's no measurement at all. You're just asking their opinion, or we are kind of extrapolating some kind of a percentage in our brain. There's no way to standardize that within, you know, four weeks later, when we go through that cerebral extrapolation, that it's going to be the same as when we did it before. So this is where we need to get out our stopwatches and we need to get out, you know, our, our counting clickers or whatever you're using to get actual numbers on things like, you know, how much they can run or jog at what speeds, um, what their two minute walk test is, what their single leg balance is, what their, um, what their ability to lift a, you know, a, a box at a certain weight to a certain height of shelf, you know, whatever you can do to get that as specific as possible. Um, and so if you look at those, and again, another one in skilled nursing or in home health is making sure that you are delineating all of those different daily activities. I see it I don't see it as often, but I have seen it where they kind of say the patient is min assist and it's kind of like a general statement. But in reality, well, what about, you know, what about when they're transferring from their bed or from their wheelchair or to the toilet or sit to stand or the gate aspect of it? Um, those things are more helpful to, to know that information. Gotcha. Great. Great. So basically what I'm seeing in, in a summary, and I know we're, we're going to cover more here, um, but just in a summary is the more detail, the better, the more it can be objective, specific, and also functional, the better as well. Right. right. And that doesn't mean that you need to have 40 different measures. If you just have one or two, that's fine. So you don't need to, you know, it's, I'm not saying that you need to have every aspect of their life measured. You just need to have some that are measurable as opposed to like a percentage or a generalization. Yeah. And then choosing the ones that are most applicable to the functional mobility, that is the reason for them coming to therapy, right? Yeah. So right. if they're coming for back pain, you know, that's limiting them from driving. Well, then we want to see a measurement that can somehow relate to that. Gotcha. Right. All right. So treatment, um, so the top one there, it's very general, you know, warm up, soft tissue massage, they're on the bike, total gym, bridges, stretch. So we wouldn't know what the manual care was. Um, we don't know what kind of bike. We don't know. Um, resistance. Yeah, we don't know resistance. We don't know any of those kinds of things. And even resistance to a certain extent, you know, I don't, that's where I'd recommend using like a table or something like that, that you can list those. Um, and I didn't even mention that in here. That's my own mistake. But if you look at the next one, it gives some times and it gives the purpose for doing it. So moist hot pack for warm up. It tells you what time, what kind of heat it was. So that could be replicated for how long. Uh, manual care, soft tissue, soft tissue massage. It tells you the area in the hamstring. You also do some trigger release in another area. Um, therapeutic exercise. 
um, you know, it's using words like progression. So it says progression of bike intensity, um, bridges progression so that you, you know, probably had been done in a previous visit and now it's being progressed from double to single leg. Um, modifications to the, the posterior leg stretch. So I'd recommend using those kind of terms. Uh, you can either do it, if, if you use like a treatment table, you may, it may not be easiest to put it there, but then that's where you could throw that into the assessment as well. So that you're using those words like progression and modification, um, change, update, increase, all those kinds of things. Uh, if we move down to the skilled nursing one, you're just gonna see some more of the same. The first one is very generalized. We don't know a whole lot of uh, what kind of, um, what the therapist is doing in that. It says supine to sit, sit to stand, transfer to lounge chair, sit to stand, gate for 100 feet. I mean, they're, they could be doing that with a loved one. They could be doing that with a caregiver. So in the next one, it talks about at least the levels of assistance and you know some some variability there. Min assist to contact guard assist while they're doing their positioning. Sit to stand with contact guard to minis, modest moderate assist. What devices they're using, um, and then things like um, if you go down a little bit further there, it says the uh, front wheel walker tactile cueing forefoot positioning. It's, it's not just saying that they were cued, but saying what the cueing was for. Um, so that there is a function tied to the cueing that you are giving them. Is that helpful? Yes. Very, very <laughs> helpful. No, this is, this is extremely helpful. So any questions comment below and you'll also attend the live panel, but I think the biggest just here is being specific and then also relating it back to, you know, how you're actually caring for the patient and then how this is relating to their progression in functional mobility. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very helpful. Makes, makes sense. Makes sense. All right. So we'll, uh, assessment, we'll do this one really quick. Cause this is where, this is where I talk about the anatomy lesson. So that first one patient continues to make progress with skilled care demonstrates decreased pelvic obliquity during transfer of body weight during locomotion. However, still not able to correctly maintain awareness of body and space force transference through posterior chain during closed, closed kinetic activity is less than optimal blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Patient appears to respond well to correction of six, seventh ring driver technique with improved load transference control during stable base. I mean, as you're reading through that, I want you to ask yourself if that's the primary information that you have, could you tell me what functional level that patient is at? It sort of sounds like any, they're doing, yeah, it sort of sounds like they're doing car transmission. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. A lot of times it does. And a lot of times I read assessments like this. Um, and that, you know, that's the information that they give me, but that tells me and that's not an assessment of the care the patient is getting. What that is, is that's a kinematic picture. Well, yeah, picture a kinematic Arthur kinematic picture of the patient at one particular time. It's kind of like you're trying to um, tell me what, it's almost like an MRI result. It's like reading a, you know, when you get your, the imaging result from someone. Yeah. So if we go to the next one, below that, patient has made significant progress demonstrated by 12 point increase in ODI score over the last four weeks has achieved short-term goal of 15 minutes of walking without pain, has achieved, achieved three to four short-term goals, and 60% of both long-term goals. I threw in a percentage there just to be nice, um, but obviously you could, you could narrow that down a little bit more. Continues to demonstrate decreased step length, lack of dorsiflexion, has not yet been progressed to try running, home exercise program has been modified, patient will continue with home exercise program during the week, so if you see, that one tells us, okay, the patient has improved in the ODI, so their back function is improving. They've achieved a short-term goal. They've achieved, they've almost achieved three of the short, three of the four other short-term goals. Um, 
they still have a decreased step length, so they have some kind of a disability. Um, pro if you really wanted to measure that, but you know, there's enough information in there already to show that the patient is progressing, but there is a little bit of a disability. Uh, you talk about that you're progressing the home exercise program, um, and then you assess, you know, you kind of go into your plan of care, discussed reduction of frequency with visits as patient is improving to transition towards discharge. Um, and it's just the similar theme in the one for skilled nursing and home health. So, you know, very little information. Um, I see it a lot where it just says patient continues to show need for skilled care. Patient continues to struggle with leaving the home. I see that very, very often in home health requests, actually, that that's like, that's the whole assessment. And I know it's difficult for you folks in skilled nursing and home health because you've got, whether it's an OASIS form or some of their other forms that are just terrible. And I agree with you. I, I don't like them. I don't think that they, um, you know, they're not user friendly. They request way more information than you need, but you still have to assess how they're doing. Um, so patient conti continues to show need for skilled care due to established um, moderate fall risk. Hopefully that's established in your objective information. You have something that is stating that fall risk. A uh, patient has demonstrated significant progress in Berg score over last time period, has achieved goal of gait with min assist 150 feet. So I, you know, I think it's kind of, I'm talking too much. <laughs> no, no, you're doing great. So I have two questions. So say you saw someone with this poor home health statement here, what would, what would you do? Like if someone is just busy and doing poor documentation, you know, what would happen? What would you do if you saw this note? Well, I mean, legally, we still have to do a certain amount of due diligence and we're going to look through that note. So hopefully if you don't have it in your assessment, you do have it up in the objective information like we talked about previously. So this is just a way um, of, you know, kind of covering your bases, but also showing that you recognize that there, that there have been changes. Um, if your objective areas don't sh talk about or show progression, then it needs to be in that assessment somewhere. So if the rest of the, if the rest of the therapist's note was great and they had like a treatment table and they had their goals in tables and it showed that the goals had progressed over time, um, they could probably get away with an assessment that was more simple. Gotcha. So it's sort of like a, there's some give and take you know, yes. or like, let's say someone, you know, cause I've seen this before where, where someone has like a really detailed evaluation and then just like briefer, like let's say four, four brief treatment notes that are fairly basic. They're sort of these one sentence, you know, it's showing objectively what they're doing, but it's, it's much more basic. And then they have a progress note or like a sort of like a reevaluation that's much more detailed is is that okay or what would happen in that situation? For most, instance, for most instances, that's okay as long as the gap of care isn't too long. So again, that's where it comes down to kind of, um, you know, hopefully anytime that patient is showing a significant amount of progress, you document it, whether it's in a, you know, a progress note or a daily note. But yeah, if it's like you've got your eval and then it's, you know, three or four or five visits and then you do, a little bit more extensive of, of a treatment or a, um, a reevaluation, that's fine. Um, where it comes, where it gets into problems um, real quick is if this is someone that you're seeing very frequently, um, that can become an issue. Cause if you have an eval and then let's say 12 visits and then there's, you know, hopefully you're still going to show progress but that's getting into a little bit of scary ground. Um, there's not very good research to show that the majority of things that we are seeing patients for, that they need care that frequently. Um, there are some, you know, like an acute spinal cord injury or stroke or things like that. Um, that's a little bit of a different story, but um, in general, yeah, having some visits where it's not quite as, elaborate is fine. Okay. That's good to know. That's good to know. And it's sort of like, 
it sounds like, and I know I'm, I'm throwing some tough ones at you and you're handling this great. Um, it sort of sounds like there's some give and take, you know, like you don't have to have every note be perfect. You right. don't have to have every note be a novel. You know, I think, I think, and obviously we're going to get to more take homes, but it seems like just really try to focus on one or two functional measurements, one or two objective measurements, and then almost try to just keep with them throughout the plan of care. Is that sort of like a really good sort of simple, simple way to make the documentation really strong? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Have some, you know, have a few things that you're just really going to concentrate on in that patient. Um, you know, another thing that I see a lot of is people will, I've seen patients that have like 18 goals and that makes it really hard to show progress when you've got that many goals. I don't think you need that many goals. So like you said, kind of narrow things down, have your times when you concentrate on it, treat them for a little while, concentrate on it again, treat them for a little while again if you feel like it need, you, know, you need it. And then each time you concentrate down, you need to go through that process of you know, assessing and, and seeing if things need to be changed. Perfect, perfect. Okay, we'll go to plan of care. Right. So this real quick plan of care, um, you know, a poor one is just having a really large time period and a, you know, one to three times a week, two to three times a week over like eight to 12 weeks. I really hate to tell you this people, <laughs> but you can't predict the future. You can try and that's what we do. You know, we, we, we give a prognosis of how well we think they're going to do. But when you're reaching into like eight and 12 weeks or beyond, and believe me, I've seen them further than that. And I know, you know, we base it off of previous treatments we've done on how patients have done before. Um, but having really long plans of care, it makes it seem like, you, you know, you, what, how the patient progresses in the future is irregardless because you think that they need that care for that amount of time, whether they get better or not. So my recommendation is that you do things like, um, you know, two times a week for four weeks, initially adjusted based upon, you know, further evaluation or, uh, you know, maybe four to six weeks is a pretty safe time period. Um, if it's someone that has had a real major a neurologic issue or some of the pediatric ones, again, that's a little bit different situation those start to fall under episodic care. Um, and so sometimes a longer period of time makes sense. Um, if we go to the skilled nursing home health, um, I see a lot of times where it just says continue per established plan of care. And it's like been copied forever. <laughs> and I see this in, in outpatient as well. So just try not to, you know, that's another thing that when you're, you know, you've done those few visits and now you're seeing them again, make sure you update that plan of care. It should pro if your patient is improving, that plan of care should probably change. Um, you know, there's that care should start to be reduced or tapered or they need more time to work on their home program, whatever it may be. So that plan of care should, should change. That's kind of the moral of the story on that one. Wow, that was, this is, and, and then Aaron here has some, has some more resources right here, but that was, that was so amazingly detailed and pretty much the best documentation talk I've ever had. <laughs> so those of you listening, share this with your friends um, because just alone, this is going to help you so much in your career, not just now as a new graduate or a seasoned professional, but for your entire career, especially if, like I said, if you're working in small practices or if you want to start your own practice, being amazing at documentation is invaluable, like we discussed before, where you are relying on your notes to get you reimbursed. So if you're ever thinking about having your own home health clinic, having your own private practice, cash base, you know, independent clinic that sometimes takes insurance. Defensive documentation is 100% extremely, extremely important. Um, Aaron, you did an amazing job. I can't think of any more questions, but is there any more tips or advice you want to give people for documentation? Yeah, certainly. Like I said, I could keep going for a while. So cut me off when you need to. But um, I know that when we had been talking originally, 
you wanted me to talk about some common mistakes. Um, yes. There's some that I ha that they might not be pointed out there. I'll try to, and then uh, I do also want to talk about um, some things that cause care to be denied, some common themes that I see. Um, and then I've got just a couple last tidbits for you. But um, so yeah, we don't need that anymore. Uh, but yeah, certainly go to those resources. I, I, I do have a blog where I try and write about a lot of these same things. And then I also do have that um, Facebook group. It's called Dark Secrets to Skilled Care. Um, it's a group where we talk about stuff like this and I do videos and things like that. So, um, all right, common mistakes real quick. One of the most common ones I see is that there's just people will request care, but they don't send any clinical information. And what I think this is, is this is a disconnect between the provider and their front office people or whoever's doing that. Um, I know a lot of offices, what they have a front office person that's tracking when a patient needs another authorization. So they'll go ahead and they'll start the authorization process. And then the therapist is supposed to go in and give that information. But I think something happens where the front office doesn't tell the therapist it was done. And but what happens is we get a request for care with no information. And this leads to one of the other common mistakes is that we never hear back. So in that instance, what happens for most places, there are a few states that actually won't allow this. The case will be placed on hold and we will request additional information. Um, we wait uh, for, most state, for, for most states, we give a, a three day wait period. After that time period, we still haven't seen anything. So that's gonna get denied because we just don't have any information. So make sure that you are in really good communication with whoever it is that's doing your, um, your authorization behind the scenes work. Um, another one is that I see quite often is sending information that's just too old. Uh, each health plan has their own regulations and to know what those are, um, I'll talk about that in a second, but as a general rule, we want information that is between seven to 10 days um, old. If if it's older than 10 days, we may request new information. Um, let's see. Another one is not reading the authorization letters that your clinics are getting back. So if a case for or, or a request for more visits is either placed on hold, um, denied either in part or in full, there needs to be some kind of a communication either sent in writing or electronically, usually by fax. Um, a lot of times it's going to be that front office person. They just look at that and they think, oh, they need more information. What happens on my end is I end up getting the exact same information that I already had. And that's not helpful. <laughs> um, but if a provider were to read that letter, they would understand that, oh, they didn't get the most recent functional score or they didn't, oh, I, I didn't send in, they didn't send in that they had, per, you know, the, the, there's no information about progress and goals or something like that. And those letters are supposed to state what information it is that we're, we're needing or that we didn't have that caused it to be denied. Um, all right, so common denials, just real, some real quick ones, some re reasons why your request for additional visits gets denied. These are, these are the most common ones I see. Again, no clinical information. <laughs> Already talked about that. No documented functional loss, no disability. Um, we've covered this quite a bit already, but again, I see it quite often. I'll see a note about a patient that all it says is they've got some kind of, you know, maybe they've got a minor weakness and they have pain. That's not enough anymore. Um, health policies are now written in a way that those are not enough to determine that that patient needs skilled care based on, on, on their health policy. So that's where you need to have those functional scores in there. Um, and then we already talked about standardized progress. We talked about frequency duration. Um, so we can just skip those, but those are, those are some of them. Some of the things we already talked about are the main reasons why care gets denied. Um, 
All right, so efficiency tips. I've got two of those really quick. Because I know a lot of what we've talked about, it seems like, well, Aaron, you're telling me that I need to write a note that's like 14 pages long. Um, and that's, and like, like Emma had asked, well, does every question, does every, does every clinical note have to be this detailed? No. Um, so that's one of the first things. Um, but beyond this is a recommendation. And this is what I did when I was out of school. I created my own templates. Um, of the information that I knew that I needed in every, at least in every evaluation and reassessment, I kept, I kept it just like on little cards. It wasn't that big. And I just had that to my side as I was doing my documentation. Back in the day, I did a dictation. So I held a tape recorder to my face with a chart in front of me of the patient and their exercises, you know, and I dictated it. So I also had that template in front of me to cue me in what it was almost like a script. Um, and then also a lot of the times when you are requesting additional visits from a health plan, they have a specific worksheet that you can use. Um, I know it seems like additional paperwork, but I would actually recommend using that worksheet at least until you get familiar with the health plan. So you know what it is that they want. Um, it doesn't take that long to fill them out. Most of them are like check boxes. Um, and to really, you know, fill those out, use the scores that they want you to use. Um, I think my last thing is just to kind of wrap up at least what I wanted to say. And then if you have any other questions, Emma, is um, I want you to look into what's called provider education. Um, most health plans, and I believe even Medicare does this online, uh, they have annual or even semi-annual education where the health plans will actually educate the providers on the information they want um, based on the care that they give. So look those up. I, you know, I can't give you a resource for every single one of them. There's tons of health plans out there and depending on where you live, they're going to be different, but I know that those are out there. Um, and for the most part, especially the ones that I've heard of, they're very poorly attended and that's um, information that could just be super useful. Um, a resource that you can use again are your front office and authorization people. A lot of times they're the ones that are going to go in your place. So go, go talk to your front office people, schmooze them, bring them donuts, you know, get them to give you the information that they've learned. Um, please don't just follow what the other clinicians do where you end up working. Um, as a new grad, I fell into this habit and, um, you know, I, I, I feel kind of pathetic that I did it, but, um, I started getting to a point to where my notes were looking like the notes of the therapists that had been, they had graduated like back in the eighties. Um, and I got into bad habits of using short phrases, not giving much information, forgetting to use uh, outcomes. And my notes started looking terrible. And it's because I just, I fell into those same habits. So um, just don't do it. <laughs> um, just break that cycle. We need that to happen for physical therapy in general to get to the next level. We need to break the cycles that are, that continue to happen. And you've probably all seen them when you went on your clinicals. Um, just break the cycle. And so again, just the last one is, you know, join Join those social media groups. Obviously, mine's the best. Work secrets to skilled care. <laughs> um, but there are other ones out there too. Like if you're looking to go into cash-based or other things, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, those will all be super helpful in ways that you can get mentored. Um, and a lot of those groups give out information, you know, that's a lot of times even free, or at least some of the free information will help you understand, you know, what you need to pay for. Because most of this kind of stuff, you're never going to get it in like a CEU established course. Um, just because, I don't know, I guess I need to start that, but uh, I've got kids and other things to do right now. So <laughs> watch for that in the future. <laughs> No, I think this has been an extremely helpful and informative uh, session. We thank you so much, Aaron, for making this amazing PDF. It'll be below so you all can get this and feel really empowered in your documentation because trust me, even though you think this is not important, 
this is one of the most important things you can do for your career and for your patients. Um, you know, well-being and just keep it simple. You know, I think Aaron did it, said it great when he talked about the template, make yourself a template. Um, you know, you can go to awittypt.com and check out more of his information there. Cause I'm sure he's got more goodies there too, that will help you with the efficiency, but just keep it simple, but keep it detailed. I think that's the best, you know, main point is Choose a couple things for each patient, make it patient specific, and then maintain that throughout their care and show how they're making that progress. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. If any of you have any questions, attend the live panel on August 17th and check out a wittypt.com or Dark Secrets to Skilled Care on Facebook. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you.